All right, so group movies, ensemble casts, they're hard to do well, right? Uh, the Avengers was fine. I know it's controversial for some of you out there. Uh, it worked pretty well, but it was a buildup of like 20 movies before you got to that one. And what happened then? They argued a lot. They didn't really grow together. It was a painful process. But recently I saw a movie that I think was the best group superhero movie I've ever seen. And the back row, the people under 15, 20 can argue with me later on. But it was called Spider-Man No Way Home. Now, Spider-Man already has a treasured place in my heart because someone who I'm close to loves Spider-Man. But oddly enough, this movie was the best, the greatest team superhero movie of all time. And let me tell you why. In almost every Spider-Man movie, like other superhero movies, what's a big part of the tension? Secret identity. Right? You put on a costume, no one can know who you are. Because what happens if people know who you are? You're a real person? Bad things, right? And Spider-Man, of all superheroes, plays with this every movie. It drives some of my friends crazy because there's nothing but tension. Will people know? Will people not know? It's always a balance for Spider-Man between truth and love. Right? On the one hand, Spider-Man wants to tell everyone he loves the truth. He wants them to know. Uh, but how does he do it lovingly? How does he care well for people at the same time? In one sense, it's all about approval, power, and control. If he tells the people who are close to him, will they still like him? Will they think differently of him or her? Power. If I let other people know, the more people who know, the more I cede power and ultimately control. If everyone knows who I am, how do I control? How do I manage the situation? It's this tension that works through every Spider-Man movie over and over and over until No Way Home. Uh, spoiler alert, probably too late for that, but that's okay. At one point, you have three different Spider-Men from different backgrounds. They're all really Spider-Men. But what's fascinating is to watch all of them talk with each other on screen. Because now that barrier, uh, that barrier of identity, that barrier of being able to talk plainly with truth and love is taken away. And it's one of the most encouraging scenes of dialogue I've ever seen. Because they're all identifying, they're all super encouraging of each other. They all care for each other. And as a result, they all grow together. Including the main character, Spider-Man. I know this is confusing, but the main character, Spider-Man, who winds up not taking vengeance because he's grown, because his other Spider-Man have spoken truth and love to him. They deeply love each other. They're concerned for each other. They tell each other the truth. And as a result, they're all redeemed. They all grow up. And that's what Paul is going to talk about in Ephesians. He's giving us a list of how to tell truth and love to each other. In effect, how to have us grow up. And he's been doing that all along in Ephesians. He's saying, Jesus has come, he has made y'all into a group, and this is what that looks like. How we have unity and diversity at the same time, all for maturity, I talked about a couple weeks ago, how our community is unique. And this morning, we're going to hear how to grow up just like all those Spider-Men in No Way Home. Because Paul in Ephesians is going to show us that speaking each other, telling each other, excuse me, the truth in love is the key for all of us to grow up into maturity. Listen for how Paul describes truth in love in Ephesians 4. We'll read verses 14 through 15 and then 25 through 32. Starting in 14. 
says, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Then down into 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Let's pray this morning as we start. Jesus, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds to hear what you have to say. Help us to see how truth in love is the key to our community. It's what makes us different. And it's how we grow up to become like you. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. This morning, we'll look at truth and love. We'll look at some examples of truth and love. And we'll talk about how to delight the Spirit, as you can see in your bulletin. Truth and love, examples of truth and love, and delighting the Spirit. First off, a couple of thoughts about truth and love from what we read this morning. First off, it's very plainly how we grow up, right? In verse 14, Paul points out that we were children. But now in 15, we speak the truth in love, and so we grow up. Fairly straightforward, fairly direct. And as I said a couple weeks ago, this is a church distinctive. It's a unique kingdom. I mean, a unique uh, community right? That despite being diverse, we're united in Jesus. And that lets us speak the truth in love to each other. And in fact, back in the Old Testament, God tells Israel in Zechariah 8, he says, the day is coming when I'm going to bless you. All nations will come to you because you have a relationship with me. And one of the characteristics of that community will be speaking truth in love. And in fact, uh, being honest and loving with each other as a community is one of the shortest summaries of Ephesians I can think of. Because what's Paul been saying all along? Jesus was here. He's left his mark on you. Care well for each other. Be honest. Grow together. But the tricky part is not truth and love, being honest and caring for each other, but combining those two. If you have just truth or if you have just love, that can be deadly, right? Love without truth? Well, that's no good. That doesn't really do you a lot of benefit, right? Because how can you ever know the truth? If your goal is to grow up and be like Jesus, you don't know how you really are and no one ever tells you. How can you grow? Uh, have you ever recorded yourself on a tape or watched video of yourself and you watch it 10 minutes later and you're like, that's what I look like? That's what I, this is terrible. And you say, well, I'll, I'll deepen my voice sort of whatever it is, right? What it is is you are getting truth in that moment and we need that from each other. Or what about the other thing? Other way, other thing. What if you have truth without love? 
Well, that's no good either, right? Because if, if you're abrasive or if you're cold and you tell fellow believers the truth about how they are or about what, uh, who, what the reaction is that you have for them, then if you're not loving about it, what happens? If you go tell someone, you need to change, and you're not gentle or loving about it, well, they're going to be much more resistant to the truth going forward, right? They're going to dig in their heels. So one without the other is deadly. And oddly enough, we tend to fall into one category or the other. Some of us are better at truth-telling. Some of us are better about being loving. It's rare to find both in the same person. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But to grow, in summary, we need both truth and love, and we have to speak truth and love to each other. It's how we grow up. And that's what Paul is illustrating here in 25 through 32. He's talking about words, actions, and thoughts. You heard me read it earlier. You can scan through it. What do we get? We get a list. Four, five different actions, different areas. And it's really organized, right? There's the, uh, the good option or the bad option and then motivation. Don't do this, do this, here's why. Over and over again. And the temptation there is to see it as a to-do list. I need to be charitable. I need to do this. I need to do that. Part because they're straightforward. But Paul isn't giving a list. We have to avoid that temptation. What he's doing is he's giving examples of what he's already said in 25. Speak truth and love to each other. Back from 14, he's saying, you need to speak truth and love to each other, and here are examples of how to do it, not a comprehensive checklist. He's describing a mindset rather than a list you would use at H-E-B. But it's difficult, like I said, right? Because we fall into one or the other by personality, by default. If we, if we fall into the, the love without truth camp, maybe we're not as truthful as we could be. Because, because why? Well, because we fear the other person's reaction. Maybe we fear rejection from the other person. Maybe we are worried about feeling guilty about what we've said. And we err on the side of love and we don't tell the truth. Ultimately, because we're kind of focused on ourselves. And the same is true on the other side. If it's truth without love, you're focused on being right. Wanting to feel better than, wanting to win conversational competitions. And again, that's because we're focused ultimately on ourselves. And Paul is calling us uh, to look away from ourselves. And, and in case we think we've got it down, Paul drops verse 29 where he says, let no corrupting or unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. And that kind of raises the stakes. I can be good enough. I can be normal. I can be un... Uh, I can be kind enough, but this is, this is wholesome talk. This is encouraging. This is actively helpful words, actions, deeds, not just being nice. This is actions, motivations, deeds, motivation that's being uh, driven by concern for the other person. Which means that every time we, we talk, or we act, or even we think in relation to other people in the church and outside the church, we need to think about our motives. Are we worried about the other person's reaction? Are we worried about disturbing the relationship? Are we bent on making sure they know that we're in control or in charge? Are we bent on winning the argument making points to impress the person. Whatever it is, we need to think about our motivation. Because all of these fall into the, 
the description down in verse 32 where he talks about let all bitterness and wrath and anger and cl clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. And malice there is a word that speaks to the motivation that we are to avoid. And, and in fact, you could, you could kind of boil all this down into those three categories I talked about with Spider-Man before, right? Approval, power, and control. Negative motivations fall into those three categories. Approval, power, and control. Approval, are you worried about other people liking you? Power, are you, make, you worried about people making sure that you know what you're incapable of, reinforcing hierarchy and control? Is what you're doing or saying or thinking bent on manipulating the situation or other people? Approval, power, and control. And these are fundamental needs, right? These are not a one-time kind of choice. Every day, every hour of every day, we're going to be faced with this choice. Do I speak the truth in love to this other person and give up approval, power, or control, or do I cling to them? And the danger here is, I don't know about you, but I'm going to choose approval, power, and control almost every time without Jesus. So if we're going to be able to tell the truth in love, if we're going to be able to be honest with each other and say it in a loving, encouraging, considerate way, a way that people can hear, then the only option is to have approval, power, and control in such crazy amounts uh, that we'd have a base that was immovable. Which brings us to the, the weird conclusion, at least weird in my mind originally, in verse 32. He gives this long list, long-ish list, and at the end, what does he say? Instead of malice, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, great. But then he says, forgiving one another felt like an afterthought. Uh, you know, speak the truth in love, share, care well for each other. Forgive one another. Seems like a, an add-on or a tack-on. But in reality, he's bookending. He says, tell the truth in love and forgive each other because forgiving other people, you might argue, is the essence of speaking truth in love. And it's ultimately how we delight the Spirit. You can see in the passage it talks about don't grieve the Spirit. If you flip that, you're delighting the Spirit. And forgiveness is a great illustration of that, right? Because what do you do when you forgive someone? You speak the truth in love. Truth, you, you have to tell yourself. You have to tell them the truth. You have to make a full assessment of what the cost is. But then you also have to be loving if you're really going to forgive someone, right? You tell them the cost, you tell yourself the cost, and then you take the penalty on yourself. You take the hit. So that when you have the chance to make the perpetrator pay in that next conversation, or that next action, or that next thought, you don't do it. When you have the chance to get back at the perpetrator, damaging the reputation or making the tables even, so to speak, you don't do it. When you have the chance to even just nurse the grudge in your own head and think about how that person wronged you, you don't do it. Words, deeds, and actions. Forgiveness, then, is to be absolutely honest and absolutely loving. The more you do that, uh, the more you take that hit, the more you break the cycle, the more it kicks in. And when I say it kicks in, keep in mind, Paul doesn't just add this to the list. He doesn't say, oh, and forgive people. 
No, look at what he says. He says, forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. Paul's saying this is not easy, right? I've, I've personally been through this. It's very difficult. But Paul is saying what you're doing is you're responding to someone who has already demonstrated truth and love, forgiveness to you, right? Because what does Jesus do when he goes to the cross? What's his motivation? It's both truth and love. It's, it's truth because he says, you are a sinner. And also love. He goes because he loves you. He tells you truth, right? He says, your situation is so desperate. You are so hopeless. You are such a disastrous wreck that the only chance you have is that God himself will die for you. That's the only chance you have. But he does so lovingly, right? Because he says, and I'm willing to go and do this for you. Jesus gave up approval, power, and control on our behalf. Approval alone. Think about the connection to the Father he had had since the beginning of time. And on the cross, that is severed. Whatever, whatever hit it is to us pales in comparison, right? Jesus asks, is asked by Pilate. Pilate says, so, are you a king then? And in that moment, that's when Jesus makes his choice. He doesn't have to say anything. In the story of Mark that we've been listening to, he's quiet half the time. Half the time he heals people and goes, shh. But Jesus says, yeah. Yeah, I am a king, and I'm here to testify to the truth. And just like that, he's a dead man. It's important, though, uh, to see the result of what he does. He speaks truth and love to us, and that transforms us. He's not making another list, right? He's not an example to follow. He's giving us a base that transforms us. Again, it's approval, power, and love. Uh, Jesus, the creator of the universe, has died for you and loves you. That is approval. The Spirit comes in, tells us the truth and love. The power of the universe that holds the universe together enables us to love others and to tell them the truth and in control. The God of the universe, the same one I described, we're told is working everything to your benefit. You have approval, power, and control in Jesus that allows us to tell the truth and love and to seek other people's benefit. And ironically, the more we seek this apart from Jesus, the more we try and take back that approval, power, and control and keep it for ourselves, the more we're disconnected from what Jesus has done. Let's remember that base as we talk to each other, as we act on each other's behalf, as we think about each other. Let's seek to grow by telling each other truth and love. Jesus has done that for us, and he's made that the foundation of our community. It is our key to growth. Let that be the motivation for our words, our deeds, and our actions as we tell each other truth and love. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you give us examples of how our community is different because it's based on you. Thank you that you have shown us what it means to tell each other honest truth, but also to do in ways that are loving. 
beg you that you call us not to come and tell each other where we're wrong, not to avoid the truth, but to tell each other the truth and immediately bear the burden, bear the penalty, bear the cost. Pray that you would make us a community that tells each other the truth in ways that are loving, that do both at the same time like you do. We rely on you to change us and ultimately to make us grow as a result. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.